Welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers, the podcast devoted to exploring the frontiers of psychedelic medicine and mental health. I'm clinical psychologist Dr. Steve Thayer, and today my co-host Dr. Reed Robison and I are discussing fear. You get to hear about my most recent encounter with that particular emotion on a mountaineering trip to Mount Baker. We talk about the difference between pain and suffering. We explore the role that struggle plays in building emotional resilience and many more topics. Please enjoy. All right, Reed, we're back at it again here on Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers. Hello. Just you and me today. No guests today. Um, But today I thought we could talk about the concept of fear and bravery, the value of struggle, and this interesting dynamic between fear and how we face it and growth. So I've been thinking a lot about fear lately, um, in particular because I just got back from a crazy trip <laughs> oh, yeah. to Washington. I've told you a little bit about this, but I thought it might be interesting to talk about it for our audience. Story time. Story time. I like it. So uh, I have been, with a couple of friends, been getting into mountaineering over the last few years. And we took a trip to Washington State to climb Mount Baker. Mount Baker is a 10,700-foot glaciated volcano. Um, And we love climbing these volcanic peaks because they kind of just stand out there in the plains. They're usually not part of these big mountain ranges. They're really pretty mountains, something to conquer. They offer different challenges. We've climbed some other ones like Mount Shasta and Mount Hood. So Mount Baker, normally, if you climb it, you know, during a time where there's, where normal people climb it, (laughs) there's, there's this nice blanket of snow that offers a pretty clear path to the summit from the trailhead. You can even see a boot pack where just kind of everyone's going on this path. Follow that path. You should be safe. You'll make it to the summit from the trailhead in eight hours or so. Mm -hmm. We knew that wouldn't necessarily be the case because we were climbing it kind of late in the summer season, but we were not prepared for what we discovered. So we decided to fly into Seattle from Utah um, and get all our gear ready Thursday night. So around 5 p.m. Thursday night, we had kind of made our plan, got our gear ready, and then we all took sleeping pills and went to sleep because the plan was to get up five hours later at about 11 p.m. and start our hike then. Hmm. You climb, you know, you start the hike at night so that you can summit before it gets too hot or before the, you know, snow melts and so you can get back down before it gets dark. We were th- guessing around 15, 16 hours total round trip, which is a burly hike. You know, it's yeah, 7,000 yeah. feet of elevation gain. We knew we were going to have to navigate crevasse fields, you know, these deep trenches in the ice that if you slip and fall into, you can be in really big trouble. So we divided into two rope teams of three, all roped up to one another with crampons, these big spikes on our boots, Mm -hmm. and ice axes to prevent one of us from falling into a crevasse. So the theory is if one person on the rope team slips or breaks through a snow bridge and falls into a crevasse, they yell fall, and the other two drop down into the snow, dig in their ice axes, and will arrest the fall. What we discovered after hiking to where the glacier began is that it was solid ice. No snow, hmm. not soft. We had to stomp to dig our crampons in every step. So if one of us were to fall, I mean, we had to just tomahawk that ice axe in in order to get a couple millimeters deep instead of burying, you know, hmm. a six-inch point into the snow. So we were a little nervous. Yeah, but, but we decided, let's go for it, you know. I didn't know any better. I'd never done some, I'd never done glaciated uh, hiking before. I mean, I'd walked on snow and ice before but your other like this. summits weren't ice or snow like they were mount snow hood. yeah but they weren't ice mm-hmm. so like when we climbed mount hood we actually we actually ascended on skis you can put these oh cool one-way friction stickers called skins on the bottom of your skis yeah i've you, gone teleskiing yeah it's basically teleskiing so you'll ascend and then when you get to the top you peel the skins off lock in your bindings lock up your boots and then you can alpine ski down it's awesome had a great That's time cool. doing that. That'd be Hood. fun. And some people do that on Mount Baker when there's snow. Hmm. So um, we start climbing, and it's a little sketchy from the get-go. You know, it's a lot slippier, it's more slippery than we thought. Um, I slipped and fell to my knees, which wasn't pleasant, and I started to get a little nervous. I wasn't afraid yet. Like, I knew that if I slipped, I might get injured, but I wouldn't die. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I started to get a little nervous. 
And then I encountered my first crevasse like <laughs> this. Just imagine, I mean, you guys can Google it, but uh, imagine a canyon in the ice. And it's, yeah. you, you know, it's dark down there. You can't see the bottom of it. And it might be anything from 10 feet wide to six inches wide. Sometimes they were just kind of cracks in the glacier. Mm-hmm. Sometimes there are these wide, you know, gullies, uh, crevasses. It's like, well, that's pretty gnarly. And we come up on, over this ridge, and there's just a labyrinth of crevasses. <laughs> and the, the, our trail is on the other side of this labyrinth. So we're like, okay, we got to get through this. So we're walking along ridges between crevasses. We're jumping over small crevasses, just like idiots, trying to get over to our trail. And that's where I first started to get this taste of like, oh, no, this is dangerous. I hope my mom doesn't listen to this or my wife for that matter. <laughs> like, yeah. Didn't your wife make you promise not to die? Yes. Before I left, she just said, whatever you do, don't die. And I said, of course, we're not going to do anything stupid. <laughs> well, by necessity, we had to do a few stupid things in order to make this hike work. So, And they weren't stupid. They weren't reckless. They were just risky. Like running and leaping over a crevasse. (laughs) Kind of, (laughs) yeah, basically. We didn't do the running jump uh, because we were tied together with a rope, but there was, you know, we we did all the safety precautions we were trained to do, uh, you Mm -hmm. know, belaying people, making sure the ropes were tight and everything like that. Um, But I did, you know, at one point, we're halfway up the mountain. It's taking us way longer than we thought, and we're on this 35, maybe even 40-degree slope of just ice. And I'm sitting there, my legs are hurting, my feet are hurting, my toes are numb, my biceps are starting to cramp from, you know, digging the ice axe in. And I'm thinking, if, if I slipped right here, I don't know if the other guys could stop me. Huh. Like, I could slide 50 yards into rocks and then into that crevasse down there. Like, I could actually die. Like, and, and I allowed that thought to enter my mind, and then I started to panic a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I remember one of my friends going, Steve... Are you right, man? You ready to keep going? Because we're roped together. They couldn't move. And I just, I wasn't. I wasn't all right for a second. And I didn't respond. Mm -hmm. I just started to breathe slow. Just just keep going. Just kind of the Dory from Finding Nemo. Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Were you in a freeze mode? I was in a little, I had a moment of freeze. Mm -hmm. And I usually don't react that way to scary scenarios. So this was... This was new on me. At least yeah. I hadn't experienced that recently in my life. I live a privileged life. You know, I don't fear for my life very often. Every once in a while on the freeway, w- freeway when somebody stops abruptly in front of me, maybe. But So I'm starting to panic a little bit, and I, I use all my best therapist training to calm myself down. And the way I historically have handled fear is to hyper-focus, uh, at least fear in these contexts, is to hyper-focus on my feet. So I would just think about my feet and just say one foot. I mean, it's a platitude, but it works. Mm -hmm. One foot in front of the other. Yeah. One more step. And so I'm, I'm traversing this ice sheet and I'm just thinking one, two, one, two, just this rhythm of moving my feet and ignoring all the physical discomfort, ignoring the possibility that I might fall, just focusing, trusting my gear and trusting my feet. And before I knew it, I was to a safe spot and I could rest. And I felt euphoric. Like, I don't know how other, other people feel. I, I mean, there are some people like extreme sports folks who love this stuff, maybe for this feeling. But yeah, having encountered fear and continued going in the presence of fear, what I discovered on the other side of it was bliss. <laughs> like, I, I, don't know, I, I was more present than, uh, than, I, than I often am, even when I'm meditating, like in my meditation practice. I was yeah. so in the present moment, having navigated the rough waters of fear. It shook you awake. Yeah. It's a good way of saying it. I was shaken awake. So the trip, I mean, I could go on and on about the trip. There were many interesting, hilarious, and weird moments. Hmm. It ended with an accidental uh, cannabis edible overdose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds like a fun story. <laughs> up, in Wa- up in Washington, it's legal, you know. We went to a dispensary, and a friend of mine who has a, we'll just say, a higher tolerance for cannabis than I do, 
uh, had this drink and I was like, oh, you know, I was, wasn't thinking because of, we were all exhausted and sleep deprived. The hike took 22 hours, by the way, instead of 16. We wow, basically did wow. a 24 hour hike because it took so long and we didn't summit. We got about 400 feet from the summit and the ice bridge we were supposed to take had melted so much it had receded and pulled away from the cliff edge. <laughs> so unless you were Superman, you couldn't get there. We were bummed, but yeah, he just chugs this thing and he's fine. It's like, well, give me a little little sip, and I take a little sip. What probably ended up being like twenty milligrams, I'm guessing. It's and, a strong uh, drink. Yeah, <laughs> it was a hundred milligram drink. Whoa. And uh, he he drank like one and a half of them. And uh, talk about fear! Like <laughs> my that was for my flight home, by the way. So I'm sitting in the uh, the terminal waiting for my flight. And I am freaking out, just super paranoid. You know, my body is going from super hot to super cold. And I was like, oh, this is the cannabis. Oh, shoot. Like, I've never, I've never had an edible cannabis experience like this before. I'd had psychedelic experiences. And I think that helped me. Kind of, I knew the space phenomenologically enough that I didn't, you know, call 911. <laughs> On an airplane. <laughs> On an airplane. <laughs> yeah, not the, not the recommended set and setting. Right. Just to... Just to throw that disclaimer out there for our audience, this is not a recommendation. This is a this is a a, a cautionary tale. Yeah, um, be more thoughtful when you uh, take on substances. Yeah, no, I've I've seen that with a lot of people's cannabis, uh, especially first time. Mm-hmm. Like they just take a little too much, and it can turn into that uh, paranoia, or things change so much. You know, you start to freak out. Like, what is happening? Mm-hmm. Will this end? Like, yeah. What's going on? I found myself frantically Googling to the extent that I could, how long does an edible cannabis high last? <laughs> <laughs> like, please let this stop. But then, you know, I, I guess along the, the theme of what we're talking about here, the way, the way I managed to get through it mm-hmm. was to lean into it. So yeah. once I sort of realized, oh, that's, this is what's happening, I, I, you know, bit off more than I could chew. Um, I knew that if I tried to stop it, if I tried to, to gain control over it, it would make it worse. Mm-hmm. So I decided to kind of ride it like a surfer on a wave. Um, and then I started listening to music, um, the same types of relaxing music just over and over again. I tried listening to a podcast to distract me. That didn't work. But the mm-hmm. music the music, and just sort of surrendering to the experience helped me get through it. Yeah. So you bring up some mind. important points. And these are good stories, by the way, but uh, (laughs) fear warns us. Fear is an emotion, Mm -hmm. and it's there for a reason. And if you attack it, it gets stronger. But I think the secret is to not be afraid of your fear. Like, you might even thank it for being there. Mm. Like, this is your warning mechanism, giving you a signal that uh, don't jump in that crevasse, you might die. and then, like you said, you, you leaned into it, you sat with it, and then just put one foot in front of the other or found uh, what you needed, what your nervous system needed at the time, like whether it's that music or that uh, breathing. Right. I like that. Listen to your fear. Thank it because it's there yeah. to keep you safe. There's that saying in, in our field of what you resist persists. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you fight against it, it's just going to get stronger. But, um, yeah, I think fear is a, a normal, healthy, quite useful human emotion. Yeah. A lot of my clients, when I try to uh, help them in this way with fear and other difficult emotions, at first it's very confusing, at least at the most annoying to them, because what they think they want is just to control emotions. Yeah. They, I don't want to feel afraid. I don't want to feel nervous. I don't want to feel sad. And it, it seems paradoxical, and I guess it kind of is, to them that to manage emotion, to get what you really are asking me to get, you have to go through them. You have to actually surrender to the emotions. You have to allow yourself to feel them because, like you said, they're there for a reason. They're there to teach us something, to communicate something to us, to show us something. Mm-hmm. And fear to protect us. When it gets... Uh, paired with something that's not dangerous, then it's a little dysfunctional though. Yeah. So, so I think about, stuck. exactly. I think about exposure therapy. You know, what, what are we doing with somebody who has a phobia? 
we are exposing them to their fear, to the thing that they are afraid of, so that we hope that at least one of two things happens. One, they discover that the thing that they are afraid of is not as horrifying as they thought it was. You know, that, that it'll be a revelation, like, oh, asking the cashier for a discount actually wasn't that bad. Mm-hmm. You know, they didn't run me out of here on a rail. Or two, that what they are afraid of is pretty harrowing, but they can handle it. You know, that either it's not too scary, I w- it was a misjudgment of, a misappraisal of the actual threat, or it was an accurate appraisal of the threat, but I was more capable than I thought I was. But either one of those insights only occurs if you lean in, not away. If you yeah. surrender to, not control. Yeah, and I think the secret recipe to that is awareness, mm. mindfulness, because it's easy to go into a reactive state, like afraid. Every emotion has a, a bodily felt sense and an action tendency, right? So if fear warns, anger protects, tears kind of cleanse and maybe want comfort, but but uh, fear is going to show up a certain way in your body. Mm-hmm. Um, might be the same or different than someone else's. But then the action tendency in many people, or uniquely in you, might be to slow down, pause, appraise the situation. Um, and I think that's key is that pause, that space in between that stimulus and your reaction is where you have this power like to take the warning in and decide how to act. Mm -hmm. I feel like practices like meditation, maybe yoga, they, they uh, increase the duration of that pause. Would you agree? Yeah. Because for a lot of us, we don't feel the pause. We don't even notice it. It's just stimulus response, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But there, I think there are ways to cultivate and grow the duration of that. Yeah. That pause. That's a key point. Uh, I cannot count the number of times I've recommended a meditation practice to someone and they said, oh, I can't do that. I can't sit still in silence. My mind is too, you know, fill in the blanks, Mm -hmm. chaotic, busy. Um, But just like anything else, it's a practice and you can work out that muscle or Mm -hmm. that skill um, just like you can. Uh, honing your attention, your uh, sensory clarity, or your mountaineering, you know, quads and calf muscles. <laughs> right. You know. Right. Yeah, I have a lot of clients asking me, "What can I actually do to improve my mental health? Like, what is what is a daily activity that yeah. I could do?" And describing mindfulness as a practice, I think, is perfectly accurate because you know you wouldn't read a book about uh, cello performance and expect to be able to play like Yo Yo Ma. Right? Yeah, you might understand some technical things about the cello and about how to play it, but you're not going to develop the skill until you rehearse. And rehearse is deliberate action repeated over time, so yep. that you can ch- you can actually change these neural pathways in your brain to make shortcuts, so that you don't have to deliberately finger that particular pattern anymore. It just happens because it's you've buried it into your subconscious through rehearsal, and. You know, meditation, I think, probably responds to similar principles. Yeah, and it does translate into, um, you know, a very useful practice skill to have when you're in an intense situation on the mountain Mm. and you're faced with engaging your breathing, Mm -hmm. your conscious breathing or something like that. You know, we practice um, so that under intense situations, you know, that can become second nature. We don't have to think about it. Right. And there are, it's funny when you talk about meditation with many people, um, you know, one minute, two minutes, three minutes might seem doable. Five minutes, uh, you start to get reactions. 30 minute meditation, a lot of people will say, are you crazy? Mm-hmm. You know, but, uh, but really there are certain schools of kind of meditation, mindfulness practice, especially in the East where they're going into retreat for a week or two at a time, say each year, to really practice sitting for long periods of time. Um, And then when they come out of that, they can weather almost any storm. Mm -hmm. And in fact, my first exposure to 
meditation practice. I was actually on a church mission in France as a young a young man, 19 years old, and I uh, was getting really interested in this. So I went into a, um, kind of a monastery and was sitting there. Uh, I was welcomed in and I uh, got to sit in meditation, but they'd come around with the bamboo stick and like whack us <laughs> during. And I was like, whoa, this is, uh, this is fascinating to try and remain present while faced with things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that's something, it was making me think of football practice, you know, the coach doing things to deliberately make it more difficult so that we could temper ourselves. We could strengthen ourselves in the face of a perturbing stimulus mm-hmm. so that we could be capable of handling the dynamic environment of a game of an actual football game where it's not a linear path. You're moving laterally. You have to react to another person's behavior. That's life, right? Yeah. So if we have this practice in the form of meditation in this case, it's presenting us with, I like the idea of being smacked by the, the, (laughs) by the, the the switch because yeah, you know, it's presenting us with a, an unpleasant stimulus to in practice. So we're safe in this container so that we can develop the skill of responding. And I mean, I can't imagine a more useful skill for day-to-day life, the skill of responding. Yeah, it's interesting that we don't give it the time, I think we both agree it deserves Mm -hmm. as as a society in general. I mean, at least mindfulness has become mainstream and there are many more ways to access and practice it. But I think in general, ask a hundred people and most would agree, yeah, I need to practice that, I don't, but they might still be going to the gym and getting on a treadmill. Sure. Um, But uh, it is hard to get ourselves to sit in meditation practice for long enough to uh, make those gains, but Mm -hmm. those are huge. They translate into some superpowers in day-to-day life. Yeah, yeah. You and I were talking about physical fitness before we recorded, and I may have used this metaphor in the podcast before, but I, I really like it. It's the idea of progressive overload. Mm-hmm. Like when you're going to build strength or build a muscle, you start with a weight. Let's say you're bench pressing. You start with a weight that um, challenges your muscles where they are right now, challenges your nervous system where it is right now. And then the next time you do the lift, you add five pounds and, or two and a half pounds. You know, a really, uh, but you do add weight. And you overload that muscle or that pathway of movement for your nervous system progressively so that eventually Mm -hmm. you've doubled your bench max or whatever. But you don't double it in a day. You double it over time. And you double it by challenging it. And this is another thing I wanted to talk about today with respect to fear is how we become more resilient to the challenges of life. You know, we're talking about practicing uh, in the form of mindfulness and meditation that can create the space between stimulus and response that allows us to then be more deliberate about our reactions. But how else do we build resilience in our clients and ourselves? Because fear, there is a risk that fear turns immediately into um, either chronic, immobilized, fearful state Mm -hmm. or reactive anger Mm -hmm. or something like that. and uh, there's a risk that it makes you small. Like that's one of the risks with how we approach fear or our perspective on it is it might constrict us to life. Like we're afraid to love because of the fear of getting hurt. Mm. We're afraid to get out there uh, in the world because of the fear of being seen. Yeah, it reminds me of the, you know, we talk about the comfort zone. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people have, have uh, discussed the idea of the comfort zone. Um, I really like the psychiatrist Phil Stutz. He wrote a book called The Tools. Mm-hmm. And in there he talks about this comfort zone and that it's surrounded by this, I forget what he calls it, cloud of pain or something like that. And on the other side of the cloud is all the stuff in your life that you think you want, right? But it's not in your comfort zone right now. And your comfort zone is constricted. It's small, like you said. Mm-hmm. Fear has, crea- has made your life small. And we've, we've used the phrase many times on the podcast, the obstacle is the way or the obstacle is the path, this stoic philosophy or this principle. Mm-hmm. So Stutz talks about changing your orientation to the cloud. The cloud is not something to run away from, not something you want to avoid. It's actually something you want to engage, even though it's painful. In fact, you want to engage it because it's painful. 
because the pain is what makes you stronger. Facing the pain, overcoming it, going through it, is what then grants you what is on the other side of the cloud. Let's say it's, you know, you, you wanted to ask this girl out and <laughs> the fear is causing you to re recoil and you don't ask her out. Well, if you say, no, I want this pain, bring it on. I can do this. And you ask her out, then that gives you the opportunity of now having this person in your life. But mm -hmm. if you had allowed the fear to dictate your behavior, bounced off of the cloud of pain, as Stutz puts it, then your world remains small. Yeah, I like, I like that. And I like to look at fear as a signpost or signal. Sure, it warns us, but it also points us to where there's a lot of potential progress or there's a very good chance that uh, your hopes and dreams and, you know, everything you desire or aspire to is on the other side of that cloud of fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have to, <clears throat> it makes me think of the, that courage isn't the absence of fear. You know, courage is actually being in the presence of fear and choosing to move forward anyway. It reminds me of this story. I think I heard it from, I may have written his name down. Um, oh, I forget his name. But he wrote a book called Take the Stairs. Mm -hmm. And he he may have had this anecdote in the book or in a podcast interview I listened to with him. But he was talking about this firefighter. He's at the top of this you know, high-rise building, and there's a fire below them. Or maybe it's above them. At any rate, they're in the stairwell. And there's a woman who is paralyzed with fear. Mm -hmm. And she's not going down the stairs. And the firefighter's saying, lady, if you don't go down the stairs, you're going to die. Like, And she's just, I can't. I can't. I'm too scared. So what he says to her is, do it scared. Yeah. And, f you know, for whatever reason, that got through to her. Like, okay, scared doesn't mean I can't. Scared is just the condition that I'm in right now, and I, I can do it scared. So it was like one step after the other, like we were talking about before. But I really love that phrase, you know, do it scared. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're, we're talking about resilience, looking at fear as a signpost, not as something that controls us necessarily, but as a, something to pay attention to. Um, we can actually accomplish a lot more than we think we can if we just change our orientation to the fear. Yeah, I like that too. The secret then really is to not be afraid of our fear mm. or not recoil from it, not fight it. Um, appreciate that it's there and uh, lean in anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, the scope of our life opens up. And I think about these other other folks that I've whose books I've read or podcasts I've listened to who, who talk about this concept. People like Jocko Willick, you know, former mm -hmm. Navy SEAL commander, wrote a book among many, yeah. uh, but one called Discipline Equals Freedom. And he has this really viral YouTube video that's cut up really cool <laughs> and it's really intense. You know, it makes you either want to shit your pants or run through a brick wall. Like, and it, it's, the concept is good. Like something bad has happened to you, good. Yeah. You know, it, you can you can become stronger because of it. It's a very yang, like aggressive way <laughs> of, of approaching our, our problems, but you know, maybe we need a balance. And it doesn't even have to be that uh, much of a, a masculine or yang um, or aggressive approach just to thank fear, thank pain for being there, both as, one, as our greatest teachers. Mm. I'm glad you provide that perspective, Reed, because when I think about it, his, when I've thought about it historically, I've thought about it fairly dialectically, for, fairly uh, almost diametrically opposed, mm -hmm. right? Like that you have the yin and the yang, you have the masculine and the feminine, you have the, you know, you know, the inner nanny who wants to give you a hug and say everything's okay, you don't have to do that hard thing, and the inner drill sergeant that says, get off your ass, get after it, stop complaining. Um, but maybe that's too stark a contrast. Yeah, because as a culture, and even through the ages, we've shied away from our emotions. Like if fear warns, great. If anger protects, uh, use that in an empowered way. If tears you know, or sadness cleanses or um, moves us towards comfort, let's embrace those rather than 
uh, what we might have been raised to do is, oh, don't cry. You fell off your bike. Don't cry. Don't be sad. Mm -hmm. Here's an ice cream cone instead. Or um, don't be afraid is something that's in our vocabulary, but I don't think it should be. Mm. (laughs) I guess, oh, be be afraid and act anyway. Have courage. Yeah. Yeah. Take inspired action. Mm Mm-hmm. With compassion, yeah. With compassion, I like that. Compassion for yourself and compassion for those around you. Yeah. Yeah, I think fear uh, really does stem from this ego. like, And at the root of it is the fear of separation. You know, the fear that, you know, oh, I can't go into this love or relationship because it'll end or I'll get hurt or I can't climb this mountain because I'm scared mm-hmm. or I can't get out there because of this fear of, uh, of, you know, separation, this illusion that, uh, of separation. But in reality, um, that, that is a kind of a constructed ego concept of that we're all, you know, really separate and we should keep ourselves protected and small. Mm-hmm. So you've got me reflecting on my like my difficult cannabis experience. Mm-hmm. And, um, fear is a signpost, and thinking about how we help our clients, our ketamine clients, navigate difficult ketamine experiences, and it's definitely of a kind of this sort of lean into. I remember our colleague Adele LaFrance talking about if there's something that occurs that shows up in your psychedelic experience that is distressing approach it with curiosity and ask it, what are you doing in my mind? That was her question for yeah. me that I really liked. It reminds me of uh, that Rumi quote, one of my favorites that every human, and I'm going to butcher it, but I'm paraphrasing here, every, you know, every human being is a guest house. Hmm. And uh, we have these visitors. It could be sadness. Uh, it could be fear. It could be pain. Um, but we greet them at the door, and the quote even says, like, we greet them laughing at the door. Mm. And we welcome them in and thank them for being there as uh, messengers and teachers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which sounds poetic. I mean, it's roomy, so it's poetic. But yeah. um, so probably difficult to do. It's, well, I'll speak for myself. It's difficult for me to do day to day. It's like to keep that perspective, to be aware enough that mm-hmm. I am a guest house instead of me thinking I'm each one of the guests as they show up. Well, enlightenment is a radical change in perspective. And I think we all know that and it's like flipping the lights on, but that's not a state that's easy to stay in. Right. <laughs> that's part of the practice is remembering that fear is a teacher or a signal or remembering to insert that loving awareness into the moment. You know, I, I don't know if this is the actual etymology of that word, remembering, but I think of dismembering. You know, you're <laughs> taking all your, your members off, your arms yeah. and legs. To remember means to put it back together. And so when I'm thinking of, like, remembering in my enlightened moments, it's like piecing a puzzle back together. Or it's like repainting a portrait. It's not like going to a file drawer and taking it out and being like, okay, enlightenment. You know, plug that jump drive in. Mm-hmm. I'm enlightened again. i got to find my way there each time. Yeah. Remembering to meet fear with loving awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There are some fears that I think are really hard, maybe harder than others, to meet with loving awareness. Um, Some of the existential ones, like that we're fundamentally alone. We're all going to die. Yeah, you had that on the mountain. Yeah. It made me think of the end-of-life anxiety study that we'll be doing with ketamine fairly soon mm-hmm. with uh, Dr. Phil Wolfson and colleagues. Yeah. The um, end of life anxiety work that's being done with psilocybin and some of the compassionate use initiatives that we would love to bring into fruition here. Mm-hmm. And how much, uh, just how important it is to uh, address our fear of death, even if it hasn't come to the surface in day-to-day life. Um, I think as a culture and as individuals, it's there more than we think it is, and there's a very big risk of it preventing us from living our lives fully. Yeah. Remember in grad school studying the existentialists, um, Rollo, was it Rollo May? 
Irvin Yalom, and mm-hmm. you know that they think a lot of psychopathology stems from death anxiety, you know, or at least yeah. anxiety about these these fundamental existential uh, crises or existential dreads. And I was listing a few of them. Like death is definitely one of them. Uh, the fact that we are fundamentally alone. I mean, that's debatable. It's a philosophy, but uh, and that we are responsible and, and free. Mm-hmm. Uh, which can be liberating, but it also implies a burden of responsibility. Mm-hmm. I have a hiking story for you that's All right. slightly relevant. This has nothing on your uh, Mount Baker story, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I was hiking with uh, my some of my kids and uh, my brother and some of his kids. We were just up in Provo Canyon uh, on a Sunday afternoon hiking, and beautiful... Scenery is golden hour. There had been a fire that had gone through Provo Canyon. So we were seeing the contrast of this, like these burned trees and then the new growth popping up. We're rounding the bend, just in awe at nature and like the resilience of it. And then right in the middle of the path is a giant dead deer carcass. Oh, wow. Like wide open, flies buzzing. Mm -hmm. And there was really not an easy way around it. And so we were stopped in our tracks. And it was really interesting because, uh, um, you know, I've been geeking out on uh, Hindu and Buddhist philosophy for quite some time. And uh, my brother has as well, and he was there with me. And we were just uh, talking about how, wow, isn't it uh, fascinating how in our culture we're so afraid of death that we, this embalming we do to bodies, like, we want the bodies at funerals to look alive yeah. <laughs> where like we can't stare a carcass. Uh, we can't stare at it without becoming extremely uncomfortable yet in other cultures, like in um, both Hindu and uh, Buddhist cultures, there are these meditations on death that involve like sitting there with um like either dead animals or dead bodies of some kind and getting over that uh, kind of recoil or that fear mm-hmm. we have um, because it does it does really prevent us from living in some ways by this, uh, this fear. Like we live out, back to the end of life anxiety, we live out the ends of our lives in such panic that prevents us from really being present for that important chapter of life. I was listening to joseph goldstein uh and sam harris's app he's got this lecture series Mm -hmm. uh, called the path of insight and one of them is about death in fact i was listening to it this morning and i mean i'm still new to this way of thinking about it but he was talking about how meditating on death the way you just described it not only would help with your death anxiety but is a pathway to intense presence yeah. Uh, and and peace, like the peace that we find with awakened presence. Um, and I, I guess the Buddha, uh, there was a story about, about the Buddha and his bhikkhus, like explaining to them how, you know, meditate on this bite of food as if it is your, your last. Mm-hmm. You know? the, not like this day, but the next breath. And that that's how you would access this intense mindful presence Presence, and awakened presence (laughs) that reminds me of the story of buddha and i'll butcher this one too because why not i'm (laughs) i'm summarizing but uh you know the story of siddhartha who became the buddha he was um born into this kind of royal family and as a kid was very overprotected like to the point where his his uh parents his father especially would not let him even see suffering like he was not allowed out of the the gates of this protective kingdom until one day um, as he's getting older as a kid he just happened to be out uh, you know being escorted through the town um, hopefully not to see any suffering but he saw a few things that rocked his world one was he saw someone who was really sick he's like whoa what is that he'd been protected from all that and then uh, Two, he saw a corpse, a dead body. He was like, what the hell is that? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, then he saw someone who's really sick and suffering. Um, But at the same time, this sage walks by. 
and saw, who saw the same things, but was filled with peace and compassion and looked at these sad things with uh, loving eyes. And, and he said, oh, I need to, uh, I need to take that path. And so he uh, took the scary step of telling his father, I'm not inheriting this kind of royal palace. I'm out of here to go on this path of uh, learning about suffering and why we uh, avoid it so much and what to do about it. Uh, mm. And yeah, it just uh, makes me think of this concept of fear and pain are actually there conspiring to shake us awake or bring us home, mm -hmm. make us alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looking at sad things through loving eyes, that what you said just struck me. Like to be able to see things that might elicit revulsion or an, an avoidance ten action tendency in us, but instead for them to elicit an approach. Yeah. Appreciation, loving eyes action tendency is is something to strive for, something to aspire to. Yeah, cuz you can it's not easy work, but you can learn to hold uh, love and anger and fear and pain. I mean, sorry, the, the fear and anger and pain in this container of love or mm -hmm. of loving awareness. Yeah, and I guess love is the container. It's not a solvent, right? It doesn't make them go away mm -hmm. necessarily. We're not trying to make them go away. We're just trying to hold them to yeah. be with them. And you talked about pain before, and I think it's important to point out... Uh, you know what we're talking about with pain and this this is just my definition and you can offer an up an alternative one if you don't agree but uh, there's pain that's very real like pinch yourself pain it's a sensory experience and it's part of life but then there's suffering mm -hmm. that you know I believe is pain plus our emotional reaction to pain mm -hmm. and that's where we have a lot of say is in reducing our emotional reaction, our attachments, our, you know, our fears, our resistance to the pain creates so much of our suffering. And that's where the money is, in my opinion, in the work. Yeah. It's one reason why uh, we have psychologists and therapists employed in chronic pain clinics. Mm -hmm. You have people whose physiological pain is uh, not perfectly managed with medical interventions. You can, you can help them a lot with mindful interventions, the kind that you're describing, where they change their relationship to their pain and it decreases the suffering, right? The controllable part of mm -hmm. the discomfort. Yeah, yeah, it can be game changing, like that perspective shift we're talking about. Instead of, oh no, there's fear again, swat it away, run away, squash it. It's like, oh, there's another messenger. Mm -hmm. That's kind of cool getting curious about it. Why is this here in this moment? Yeah. And what do I, what does my truest, deepest self want to do about it? <laughs> yeah. And if anyone is listening uh, who is, you know, either a therapist or a non-therapist, just anybody who lives with daily pain, lives with mm -hmm. daily fear, you know, um, we are not trying to imply that these things that we're describing are easy or intuitive even. Sometimes they're very counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. and can be very, very difficult. Uh, but that doesn't make them not true or not potentially helpful. Yeah, and like you pointed out with the exposure therapy example, there are times when due to, say, trauma, stress, other wounds, we can get stuck in this kind of chronic fear state. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a very real phenomenon that, uh, you know, does require some, some serious work and interventions and generally yeah. professional help to address. Um, but uh, even little shifts in that kind of work can go a long way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think of how I felt on that mountain um, and thinking of the clients that I've had whom I know feel that way almost constantly mm -hmm. and it, it gives me I mean it's humbling and uh, helps me have even more compassion for those folks and helps me understand what you just said that even a little bit of relief can go a long way I mean we'll go so far as to 
stick a needle in the back of somebody's brain and give them a stellate ganglion block just to turn off the chronic signaling of the fight or flight system. I mean, chronic fear and chronic anxiety and trauma related is no joke. But it it does, uh, it does tie into the psychedelic experience. Like you were saying, um, in that, uh, sometimes these psychedelic experiences can be like a death experience. Mm -hmm. They can be a mystical, blissful experience of oneness where you're getting beyond that illusion of separation and the root of your fear in that way. But uh, if you experience something so frightening um, or even a death, like kind of this, this experience of idea of or vision of death during a psychedelic experience that could be extremely therapeutic in fact in our group ketamine the other day we had someone experience that Mm -hmm. they were telling the story to us afterwards of how they have this uh, fear of water Mm -hmm. perhaps uh, an appreciation of the power of water and uh, but also maybe a fear of drowning which isn't that uncommon but then as they started to experience something like that in a ketamine vision and didn't resist it and let it happen, it turned out that there was a whole blissful, insightful experience on the other side of that big fear. Yeah. It's amazing. It, it makes it, it helps me understand why, well, I guess it helps me understand the, the data on the psilocybin research for end-of-life anxiety. You have these cancer patients that were given psilocybin, and they do so much better Mm -hmm. than people with just therapy. It provides for them a death experience to actually move through death. Like, that's hard to do. We can't give people exposure therapy to actual death, but now we can (laughs) with with something like psychedelics. It's a a rehearsal near-death experience. I experienced that uh, on my second or third ayahuasca uh, ceremony. Mm -hmm out of the country when, uh, you know, the first, and I may have told some of this in here in different chats we've had, but, you know, when I first drank ayahuasca, um, the first night tears just flowed Mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't really understand where they were coming from. And there was, you know, this roller coaster of uh, kind of emotions and insights. But uh, I think it was on the second night, at some point, I just had this uh, kind of vision of me falling to my death. Mm -hmm. Um, And I didn't immediately die. I was there like broken and kind of all um, alone and afraid in the jungle. And there are these like avocados falling around me um, because they would fall in this setting and they'd startle me a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think it would be some like animal in the jungle but but I'm there and I'm trying to ask for help but no one could hear me and uh, and then you know it's one of the more intense experiences but then after that um, after kind of surrendering to that it was one of the most liberating things like I um, coming out of that experience having seen myself die like shed more layers of like fear and resistance than I knew I had. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was just floating through life for days or weeks afterwards um, in this like open hearted state, Um, but more open to life because I really do believe that, you know, if we resist fear or get stuck in that state, we're constricting to life. But then if we can let go of some of that, you know, fear can show up, but we can still kind of, uh, navigate or float through life with this lightness or openness. Doesn't that seem ironic that, you know, a fear of death would make us closed off to life and that an acceptance or an awareness, a mindful acceptance of death would open us up to life. Yeah. But you see it all the time, right? People with near-death experiences or who have reached this kind of enlightened awareness about death. Yeah, I think that's what the Buddha set out to do is realizing that uh, you know we there is a real risk of closing off to life because of the fear that life will end or that like in fact every relationship we have is coming to an end at some point in this physical realm 
Like everyone will die. Um, everyone will pass on to whatever's next afterwards. Um, and so if we really gave in to that fear of loss, then we would never connect with anyone. Mm. Yeah, perspective is the best anzilic mm-hmm. in my mind. Yeah, awareness. Zoom out. I'm thinking of that pale blue dot concept. Is it Carl Sagan? Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And sometimes there's this great YouTube video where it starts like on a city and it zooms out and zooms out to the world, zooms out to the solar system, to the galaxy. And it goes so far out to like the known observable universe. And the scales are just mind boggling. It's a psychedelic experience in and of itself. (laughs) But, you know, when I'm feeling particularly perturbed and I can remember to just breathe and in my mind, my brother James told me to do this when I was a kid. I don't wonder where he learned it, but just like Google Maps, just zoom out. Like how many people do you think are in that snapshot, that satellite snapshot with problems and stories? Just put yours into perspective. Not that yours don't matter. Mm -hmm. They all do. But in perspective. And it allows you kind of to relinquish your stranglehold on controlling these experiences and the aperture of your life expands. Yeah, you're connecting with that kind of vast reservoir of shared humanity, the collective unconscious, Mm -hmm. where we have infinite resilience. Like we can, it's kind of like those meditations on the choppy surface of a body of water can look kind of uh, chaotic, but if you go down beneath the surface, there is this infinite reservoir Mm. of uh, stillness that we all can access. Like if we get out of that I state and into this uh, like observer mm-hmm. or witness of the experience without denying the experience or disconnecting from it. Yeah, yeah. Well, Reed, we've covered a lot of ground uh, with respect to fear, resilience. Um, anything else that you wanted to share with our audience before we wrap it up? No, I'd just sum it up by a reminder, a note to self to... Uh, you know, force no pain away um, or fear because it's all there conspiring to wake us up and bring us home. Yeah, I like it. Welcome it in. Well, thanks again. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Glad you survived the mountain. Me too. <laughs> Hopefully we'll survive many more to come. Thank you for joining us today. Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers is brought to you by Nova Mind a mental health company that specializes in psychedelic medicine and research. You can learn more about Novamind's mission to increase access to legal, safe, and evidence-based psychedelic medicine at novamind.ca. If you like what you heard today, please subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're using to listen or watch. Also, if you're feeling generous today, please leave us a glowing review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. This will help us get into the ears and faces of more people and help us put wind in the sails of the psychedelic medicine renaissance. Thanks for listening.